This lecture is on tort law. The tort law lectures will consist of two. This first one will cover an, an overview of torts, types of torts, intent, remedies, etc. And then we'll talk about negligence. Then the second tort lecture will be on specific business-related torts. A tort can simply be defined as a civil wrong other than a breach of contract. You must recognize the fact that a breach of contract in and of itself is a civil wrong. Torts are not necessarily based on the wrongdoer's intent to injure or necessarily on a bad act. There is what's called strict liability, and strict liability may result regardless of intent or maliciousness or negligence. In common law, tort law grew out of the original seven torts to the um, many that the law recognizes today. And obviously the tort law grew out of uh, Old Testament law in Exodus in which the, um, the law spoke of uh, certain wrongdoings uh, and gave certain remedies um, uh, for um, the victims. Let's look at tort law as a continuum based on the intent to injure. This little exhibit right here would reflect that continuum. And if we were to draw arrows on both ends of uh, the continuum, it would reflect thus. So we can classify torts into three broad classifications intentional torts, negligence, and strict liability. Intentional torts requires maliciousness or intent to injure, or the defendant, the, the wrongdoer, knows with substantial certainty that injury will result. Negligence, as we talked about in the very first lecture, is the failure to comport to a standard of care. And the strict liability is the newest of the three classifications. And that um, strict liability results when the defendant undertakes an ultra-hazardous activity. And that ultra-hazardous activity results in an injury to the plaintiff. We said that the intentional torts grew out of the seven original intentional torts. Battery, assault, false imprisonment, false arrest, malicious prosecution, trespass to land, trespass to chattel. And then, of course, we've got some newer versions. And we've got what we may refer to as quasi-intentional torts, and broadly speaking, you may even call those intentional torts. And these are business-related torts that develop over time much uh, in a period much longer than the seven original intentional torts. In between the intentional torts and negligence, we've got some activity, uh, some actions that uh, are not as bad as intentional torts because we don't have the uh, necessarily, we don't have the intent to injure, but we've got acts that are worse than negligence. In essence, uh, maliciousness may be inferred because uh, these acts should not have happened. And that is quasi-intentional may, uh, may be referred to a gross negligence, which would flow about here 
and in recklessness which would flow about here and in willful or wanton which would flow around here. Gross negligence is simply we grossly fail to do what we're supposed to do. Recklessness, we knew what we were supposed to do and we conducted the activity that had a greater chance of harm. We conducted it anyway. And willful or wanton, we really should have known better. Um, we didn't intend to hurt, but we we uh, we had no um, we didn't have the consequence. We we didn't care about the consequence. All right, let's first look at the seven original intentional torts. By the way, these quasi-intentional torts, these business torts, we'll talk in the second about in the second lecture. The seven original intentional torts are battery. Battery battery is the harmful or offensive touching of a person without consent or privilege. Consent or privilege uh, would be a defense. Consent of it is, is self-explanatory. The plaintiff either gives express consent to the action or implicitly does it. For example, um, as, um, as an athlete in a contact sport um, would do that. Assault is the causing of a reasonable apprehension of a harmful or offensive touching. It is not the actual touching um, or the battery itself. If I throw a rock at someone and I intend to hit them and I hit them with a rock, that's battery. If I throw a rock at someone and that someone sees me throw the rock at them and I miss them, but I cause them to uh, fall over and hit their heads on uh, a fence post, that would be an assault because I'm causing a reasonable apprehension of a harmful or offensive touching. False imprisonment is when the defendant causes the plaintiff to be bound in a certain area through uh, physical means or through uh, threat of imminent harm. If I lock a student in a classroom intentionally, that would be a false imprisonment. False arrest is when the defendant causes the plaintiff to be arrested by um, the public officials uh, knowing that that individual did not commit a crime. Malicious prosecution is when the defendant files a lawsuit against the plaintiff knowing that uh, that the plaintiff had done nothing wrong and there was no basis for any lawsuit. Trespass to land, everybody understands. It's when you go onto somebody's land without consent or privilege. Sometimes going onto someone's land, there there is consent. And then there's privilege, for example, if a policeman or a fireman or a postman or um, an electric meter or water meter um, reader goes on there. Trespass to chattel is damaging somebody's personal property. It has a newer meaning and uh, it's somewhat uh, related to the, the uh, newer version called conversion. Trespass to chattels used to be for the personal property you vandalize somebody's personal property, you stole it, or something of this nature. Well, that has been that has morphed into conversion. The tort of conversion, although it's not uh, one of the original intentional torts, it means the same thing in large respect, or it's in, but it's broader, and it gives rise converge the tort of conversion in Tennessee and other states. Um, I don't know if it's all states, but um, Tennessee certainly does, recognizing it's so bad that uh, a court, the law requires for treble damages, three times the, the value of the property lost uh, or damaged. And conversion includes the destruction of someone's property, 
the misdelivery, the intentional misdelivery, um, vandalizing, um, theft, um, those types of things. Nowadays, trespass to chattel, at least since in the internet era, has morphed into trespass uh, to um, intangible personal property. Uh, in the in the mid 1990s, 1995, uh, and and uh, shortly thereafter, the uh, internet service providers use the tort of trespass to chattel to um, civilly prosecute um, a firm uh, called Cyber Promotions that acquired, somehow acquired the email list, the customer list of each of the three uh, largest internet service providers, Earthlink, uh, CompuServe and AOL and this um, cyber promotions would send spam to these customers and the um, undeliverable emails would bounce to the internet service providers uh, servers clogging them up and of course the clients um, of the internet service providers uh, didn't like being spammed either. So the lawsuits, with lawsuits against the, those big three internet service providers against Cyber Promotions Inc., each of them winning, the court applied the trespass to chattel tort. Um, two of the other newer intentional torts Intentional infliction of emotional distress. This is intentionally causing somebody to suffer emotional pain. There has to be a showing of physical or mental injury. Physical or mental injury. Meaning there has to be a showing, you, know, you have to have be under a doctor's care or something like that. Uh, simply alleging that you hurt my feelings is not enough. Tennessee recognizes the tort of outrageous conduct. Um, they recognized it in the late 60s, early 70s, in which um, it occurs when the defendant uh, conducts himself in a way that injures the plaintiff and the defendant's actions are so outrageous that they're intolerable in a civil society. Punitive damages can result. In fact, is punitive damages can result in any of these intentional torts. Punitive damages may also result in any of these gross negligence, recklessness, and willful and wanton uh, actions. And that's because um, punitive damages to meet due process requirements under the Constitution, under the 5th and 14th Amendment, requires a proof of maliciousness. Requires a proof of malice. And so the intentional tort, they're found because it's part of the tort, and then these quasi-intentional, they're inferred. Let me give you an example of outrageous conduct. Tennessee case, uh, it was not the first case, it might have been the second Tennessee Supreme Court case. Um, case entitled, uh, case titled Johnson versus Women's Hospital. On Getwell Road in Memphis, there used to be a small hospital for women. And they did uh, usual things uh, from the 60s and 70s, usual, usual type of medical care for um, um, pregnancies, maternities, um, um, uh, stillbirths, handling stillbirths and things of this nature, D and C's. Mrs. Johnson had been a patient at Women's Hospital and she had had a stillbirth 
She was concerned about proper disposal of her baby, and um, the folks at at, John, at Women's Hospital assured her that they would take care of her. Now she's assuming that that it would be disposed of in a in a dignified fashion, like she would dispose of it, um, like a person, um, not in in terms of a um, a funeral, but um, certainly dignified. She uh, later returned to the hospital for some treatment, and while she was there, they uh, she asked about the um, dis- disposal of of her baby, um, uh, you know, to assure get assured that that it was probably taken care of. And one of the um, employees of the hospital said, "Sure, we, you know, we we took care of it. You want to see?" So we wheeled her down the hall in a in a wheelchair, and they came to a side room, and they opened up a closet door, and they showed Mrs. Johnson her baby. The, the baby was in a jar of formaldehyde, um, to which Mrs. Johnson did not take this well, as you would understand. Um, she uh, suffered emotional injury, and um, and, and emotional pain. And she sued Women's Hospital um, under a claim of outrageous conduct. And the court there cited the rule that I just gave you that it was, they were guilty of outrageous conduct because their actions were so outrageous that they would be intolerable in a civil society. Let's look at damages in tort actions. Compensatory damages are the norm. They are meant to compensate the plaintiffs for their actual out-of-pocket expenses and lost wages and profits. Also covers such non-economic damages like pain and suffering. These these, uh, out-of-pocket costs, lost wages, profits, these are economic damages, medical expenses, and, and so forth. And the pain and suffering is, are non-economic damages. And then, of course, there are punitive damages. And we've talked enough about punitive damages. And then the third type of damages, broadly speaking, are nominal damages. There are no actual damages um, per se, or the actual damages are not proven with um, any specificity. They're merely speculative, and if that's the case, then if the party has proven his or her case, then a court will order nominal damages. That usually is one dollar. But this also um, may give um, the court the opportunity to um, order attorney's fees uh, and cost if there's a finding. Um, so we don't need to talk about punitive damages anymore. Just remember that malice, uh, in order to get punitive damages uh, for constitutional purposes, due process, malice must be proven. Um, through some bad act of the defendant. Either either there's intent to act, meaning the act was malicious, or there was ill will or outrageousness to uh, imply malice. And the, the, the burden of proof for this uh, malice, for punitive damages, is uh, by clear and convincing evidence. You know, there are five... Um, burdens of proof and clear and convincing evidence is the second highest. The highest of the burden of proof in criminal matters is beyond a reasonable doubt to a moral certainty in Tennessee. Then clear and convincing evidence is next. Third, and it's the norm for tort law, In civil prosecution, that is, the plaintiff must prove the case by 
a preponderance of the evidence. More likely than not. Then we get in the lower tier of probable cause. That means there is sufficient evidence to believe that someone has committed the act. Probable cause is required for search warrants or criminal in criminal matters. And um, probable cause is also uh, required for defenses uh, for um, merchants under um, anti-shoplifting statute to be a, to get the defense, the anti-shoplifting statute defense. And then, of course, the bottom, the lowest level, is reasonable suspicion, and um, that usually falls for um, uh, administrative agencies uh, doing their administrative jobs, entering to inspect. I don't want to talk about class action lawsuits, but recognize the fact that class action lawsuits is the way for trial lawyers personal injury lawyers, and to get um, um, to um, be able to sue one defendant for a multiple action or one action that affects multiple people, where multiple people are injured as a result. And it may be something... Uh, like uh, you know, a fraud action against Blockbuster uh, on how they handle um, um, transactions. The, de the lawyers usually make the most money on these things. They have been cut back uh, federal um, class action lawsuits under the George W. Bush administration, uh, reduced the forum shopping and uh, required uh, um, you know, class actions uh, unless the smaller ones to be in federal court rather than state court. We've already talked one time about the elements of negligence. What I want to do now is to kind of flush uh, this out in the discussion of tort law. Remember, there are four elements of negligence duty, breach of the duty, proximate cause, and damages. And the plaintiff has a burden of proving all of them. And the plaintiff must prove it, um, must prove the case by a preponderance of the evidence. First is duty. This is a reasonable person standard, which is the norm. How would a reasonably prudent person act under the circumstances. Now, different groups of persons have different duties. For example, property owners owe a duty to business invitees and trespassers. Business invitees um, are shoppers, students, persons that um, have a quid pro quo, generally, with the owner of the premises or the operator of the premises. Trespassers are persons who are on the premises illegally. And we also have a different, we may have for trespassers, we may very well have a, a different duty from adults to students. Let's take the case of McKee versus Gilge. In McKee versus Gilge, um, Gilge is a, a bad actor, and he has a, a compatriot who's also sued. And um, but the principal defendant is the operator of the Columbus Clippers minor league baseball stadium. McKee is the plaintiff. McKee was at the Columbus Clippers baseball games, a uh, game with uh, with his family. And Gilge and his buddy uh, are sitting in the stands, and they've been drinking a lot, and they're shouting obscenities, and they're they're rude, uh, and they are acting badly. McKee tells them to stop. 
arguments ensued, threats, I'll come up and you know whip your rear end, that sort of thing. But McKee never told any usher or security guard at the stadium about Gilge and his buddy. So the 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 uh, the the security guards uh, and representatives of the Columbus Clippers or the stadium had no knowledge of it. After the game, unfortunately, McKee uh, and Gilge and his buddy meet up in the parking lot, and Gilge and his buddy proceed to beat up McKee in front of his family. Now McKee sues all of them, Gilge, his buddy, and the Columbus Clippers. What are you going to get from uh, a drunken spectator who just beats you up? Not much chance of getting any recovery at all. So why would he sue the Columbus Clippers? Simple is this is deep pocket. He's going for the defendant that has the uh, propensity or that has the ability to pay money. The court has to apply the proper standard. Now, generally, the duty that the owner of the premises has to a business invitee, which is like McKee, is a duty not uh, a duty to reasonably inspect the premises and to remove any hazards within a reasonable period of time. Put another way, in this way, is a duty to protect against known threats. And here, McKee is arguing, you have a duty to protect me against rowdy, drunk um, patrons, spectators, fans. A court agreed with the Columbus Clippers because there was no proof of any prior incidences where the drunken spectators had caused violent acts against others. And because McKee did not notify the um, security guards of, um, of Gilge's behavior, they had uh, no reasonable knowledge of any... Um, threats or risk of violence against McKee and therefore they were not liable. A duty may be created by the adoption of a policy, of a business policy um, by an entity. If if um, a business adopts a policy that will protect um, the customers, um, then if they fail to meet, if they fail to follow that policy, and um, and the customer is injured, then there's liability because it's failure to meet a duty. This is the case of Mausner versus Atlantic City Country Club. It's New Jersey in 1997, but they cite a Tennessee Supreme Court case from 1991. In Mausner, Mausner is is um, is a golfer um, who was customer of Atlantic City Country Club, and Atlanta and Mausner has been struck by lightning, an act of God. Atlantic City, but Mausner says that Atlantic City has um, has a policy, a safety policy, to warn the uh, golfers out on the course of um, of uh, inclement weather, and they failed to do that. And because they failed to do that, uh, he did. He was out on the course, uh, and he was struck by lightning. Atlantic City had adopted a policy of monitoring the weather and warning um, the golfers of inclement weather. But in this particular time, they didn't do it. Now, Atlantic City 
defended the case, arguing, well, this was an act of God uh, that they shouldn't be liable for, um, that Mausner had assumed the risk of being struck by lightning, and that Mausner should have known better. And the court, uh, following Hames versus State of Tennessee, um, similar set of facts in which the State of Tennessee, the, the Supreme Court, held that um, the such rule that I just gave you, the adoption of a policy to protect um, the plaintiff and the failure to follow the policy resulting in the injury to the plaintiff is actionable. The court here held that way and then uh, remanded the case back for trial uh, on those grounds. Second element is the breach of the duty where the defendant fails to do what he or she is um, required to do by law. And the third is the proximate is the breach of the duty must be the proximate cause, meaning the but for cause of the injury. Here is foreseeability. Foreseeability of the injury is required. It, the foreseeability must not be remote. It must be reasonable. Let's take, uh, I don't know if you remember um, the, um, you know, the television show uh, Jenny Jones. It was, um, it was like um, Jerry Springer only without all of the violence. Well, in Jenny Jones, in, in Graves, um, in, in a lawsuit um, against Jenny Jones, it, I think it's Graves versus um, Jenny Jones and um, Warner Brothers. And Warner Brothers are, is the big one here because it's the producer of the show. Um, Jenny Jones had a show in which she invited the defendant um, in this particular case, the perpetrator, um, enticing him to come as, as a participant on the show because there was a secret admirer. And, of course, he, he came and, and the secret admirer was another man. Uh, and the defendant did not take it very well. Now, he didn't cause any injury to his secret admirer uh, there at the show. I guess they, he probably would have if it was Jerry Springer's show, but this was Jenny Jones, uh, a little bit more sedate. Um, but three days later, he acquired a gun and then killed his secret admirer. The survivors... Um, of um, of the decedent, then sued all involved, Jenny Jones and Warner Brothers, the producer. And the question, the issue in this that particular case, was the um, production of the show. Was that the that was was that the proximate cause of the injury? And there, then it required a look of foreseeability. And the court found that it, the, the injury was too remote. The waiting of the three days was um, not the proximate cause. I believe had it happened on the same day, I think the court would have found liability. The last of the elements is damages, which we've talked about. One of the principal legal rules in tort law, and it applies to, um, corporate governance as well, um, and uh, business association laws, is the doctrine of vicarious liability. The notion of that term vicarious means through someone else. And in vicarious liability, the defendant is liable for the tortious act of someone else. It's based on a relation, uh, on an agency relationship. 
Now, the notion of agency relationship, this is old common law in which there is a principal and an agent. And an agent acts for the principal. You can, you can look at this from a sports agency perspective, how a sports agent um, acts for the athlete. You can look at a real estate agent, how it acts for the homeowner in a sale. It's similar to this principal-agent relationship is an employer-employee relationship, where the employee is the agent of the principal, the employer. An agent can bind the principal in a contract that's intended to benefit the principal, and an agent can bind the principal if the agent is acting within, within his or her scope of employment. This is the case in an employer-employee relationship. Generally, though, employers are not vicariously liable for the torts of their independent contractors. Why? Because independent contractors are not employees and independent contractors are hired to bring about a result without uh, the requisite control by the employer in telling them what to do, when to do it, how to do it. The employer in an independent contractor situation wants the result and he leaves it to the independent contractor to perform. There is a, a second uh, general rule, and that is an employer is not vicariously liable for the criminal acts of an employee. Now, that's the general rule. Or even the intentional act of the employee. But as a caveat in those two situations, if the employee is acting within the scope of the employment, now usually an intentional or criminal act is not within the scope of employment. For example, beating up a customer, stealing somebody else's, uh, an employee stealing somebody's property, things of this nature. That's usually not within the scope of employment. But if the employee has been directed on what to do by the employer, or if the employee is acting in the furtherance of the employer's business, for example, if a bouncer at um, a bar has been told by his employer, by his supervisor, if anybody acts up, throw them out on their ears. And if um, somebody has had too much to drink and they're a little rowdy, and rather than um, subduing them inside or calling the police or treating them humanely, the bouncer picks him up by the uh, shirt collar and the belt and throws him out the front door onto the, the drunken guy's um, face and he breaks out his teeth and breaks his nose and so forth, that probably vicarious liability would attach. Why would you, would you sue the bouncer? Yes, you would sue the bouncer and you would sue the employer as well, um, generally for deep pocket purposes. So what about, what's the employer's dilemma? The employer can, can um, find itself liable for a number of um, actions. Negligent hiring. Negligent hiring is when an employer hires someone that it should not hire. He does this negligently. Negligent firing. You fire someone that you shouldn't fire. Negligent retention. 
you don't fire somebody that you should fire. Negligent training, um, you hire an employee and you don't train them how to properly and safely do their job. And then negligent supervision, you hire someone and you don't supervise how they do the job and uh, someone gets hurt or someone's property is damaged. Let's talk about defenses. Let me give you an example of, um, of these two in action. Um, some of you may recall a basketball player and an NBA basketball player and uh, later an NBA coach of the Houston Rockets um, named uh, Rudy Tomjanovich. Rudy T as he was called. Now Rudy T was a pretty good basketball player in the NBA uh, but his career was cut short some because of of uh, an injury he um, incurred in a game with Los Angeles. Um, the Rockets were playing Los Angeles. Now Los Angeles had this power forward um, and um, the power forward was you know acted you know he was, he was pretty mean at times he was uh written up uh in an article in sports Ill illustrated as a as an enforcer in the nba basically he was to be the, he was a, the muscle on the inside now the lakers had it at center kareem abdul jabbar and you know um kareem abdul jabbar was was an outstanding player but he he had no size at all uh, he was finesse. He was finesse all the way. And in this game, uh, Rudy Tomjanovich and, and Rudy Tomjanovich, I believe, is also um, he was a, a forward. He was a nice guy, and the Tomjanovich was down on the end of the court, and he noticed, uh, you know, something going on on the other end of the court, and there was. Um, um, there was the perpetrator down there, and his name um, escapes me. At least for right now, it escapes me. And uh, and there was a tussle. Now Rudy T is a nice guy. He goes, he he trots back down to the other end of the court to try to act as peacemaker. And um, the Laker player saw him coming out of the corner of the iron, and he thought he was going to be attacked, so he swung around. As Tom Janovich approached him, and he slugged Tom Janovich in the eye and the cheek, and he, he just crushed all the bones, you know, and he ran the eye socket in the cheek. Obviously, great pain, great expense, um, long time uh, convalescing, so forth. Uh, keep in mind, this was this was a period before. Um, a broken bone and they would just slap a, a mask, a protective mask on the face. Now, as a general rule, you did not, one player did not sue another player for um, um, for an intentional striking uh, of the person. But in this particular case, Tom Janovich sued the Lakers. And he sued the Lakers under a couple of theories. One, for vicarious liability. Now, I had said that, as a general rule, employers are not vicariously liable for the intentional acts of, of an employee. Unless, of course, it's within the scope of employment or directed. And they also sued the Lakers under a claim of negligent training and supervision. And these negligent training and supervision is direct liability. It's not vicarious liability. And um, intentional injury 
remember, gives rise to punitive damages. The court, in hearing the facts, um, found that the Lakers had encouraged um, their player, um, their power forward, to um, to act in in a more brutal physical to play with a, a a very physical game, and whenever he would be um, kicked out of a game for fighting, um, the Lakers never suspended him, never docked his pay, uh, you know, paid him. I mean, it, he was doing what they wanted him to do. Uh, they didn't teach him. They didn't teach him to play within the rules. They encouraged him to push the rules, um, to play hard, and to play a more violent game, um, a, a more physical game. And the court found that because he was played, he he was not punished. Um, by the team, um, that he was not properly trained, he was not properly supervised, and that they were not only liable for negligence in training and supervision, they were also vicariously liable for the intentional tort um, committed on him. And um, Rudy Tomjanovich won a couple million dollars uh, in the uh, late 70s, I think this was, late 70s, early 80s. Let's talk about the defenses. Several defenses, assumption of risk. We can ignore last clear chance because now that's been uh, subsumed in comparative fault. Last clear chance is an old automobile uh, tort defense in which if the plaintiff had the last clear chance to avoid an injury, then the, the plaintiff's case was barred. Let's first look at assumption of risk because contributory negligence and comparative fault um, are, are similar in effect. Assumption of risk. If the plaintiff knows of and a, a risk inherent in an activity and the plaintiff proceeds in light of that risk and is injured as a result of that inherent risk, then the plaintiff is regarded as assuming the risk of injury and the plaintiff cannot recover. The risk must be inherent in the activity. For example, in... Um, uh, if a plaintiff goes deep sea diving, goes on a charter, deep sea, uh, not deep sea diving, uh, uh, deep sea fishing, um, big game fish, and um, then there are other customers on this fishing charter. Let's assume that um, the the plaintiff is fishing, and on the other side of the boat, uh, one of the other um, Customers has hooked a big fish and he's pulling and he's tugging and he's trying to reel in the fish and he's fighting it hard and let's suppose that the line breaks, snaps back, recoils all the way across the boat, hits the plaintiff in the face, lacerates his face. Deep gash. Can he sue either the other fisherman, the customer on the charter, or the charter boat. And in that particular case, there is a risk inherent in deep sea fishing that a line will break. And therefore, uh, you would assume that a reasonable person, a reasonable person going on uh, a deep sea fishing charter boat to go fishing would uh, would be aware of that risk and would as thus assume the risk and would not be liable. All of you have attended a baseball game or a softball game and there is um, 
an inherent risk in, in attending a baseball game of being struck by a batted ball or an errantly thrown ball. Or nowadays, even a broken bat. Or a hot dog from um, thrown by a vendor or a t-shirt thrown by a t-shirt gun. Right? Or even a hot dog thrown by a hot dog gun. Um, it's a risk inherent in the game. And therefore, if a person goes to a game and is being is hit by a shattered bat or um, a, a ball that's uh, a line drive um, that uh, strikes a person in the in the stands, then that injured spectator cannot recover. The only duty that the operator of a stadium has is to provide a reasonable number of seats in a safe area, and that is the screened-in area behind home plate. That's a case from Murphy versus Steeplechase uh, Amusement from the 19 from 1937, I think. In um, the judge. Judge Learned Hand, I believe, or, or Benjamin Cardozo um, from New York Court of Appeals, uh, in so holding, held that that's all that's required, that, that's all the legal duty that's required, and, and the timid can stay at home. Let's go to uh, assumption of risk, or no, let's go to um, contributory negligence. Contributory negligence is the common law, right? It, it developed through the common law. It's been around a, a, a long time, and the defense of assumption of contributory negligence is that if the def if the plaintiff in any way is negligent and the plaintiff's injury contributes to his or her injury, if the plaintiff's negligence in any way contributes to his or her injury, then the plaintiff's case is barred. It doesn't matter if the plaintiff is, is less at fault than the defendant. If the plaintiff was also negligent and negligent and that negligence could have could have caused the injury, then the plaintiff's case is barred. Doesn't matter if the plaintiff is is ten percent at fault and the defendant is ninety percent at fault. The case is barred. It's a harsh rule. Well, given that it's such a harsh rule, uh, over time, uh, and it developed from a minority rule into the majority rule now, uh, such that it's, it's the general rule, is comparative fault. And comparative, the comparative fault doctrine, which Tennessee recognized for personal injury cases in 1994 or 1995, the comparative fault doctrine says if the, uh, or it has, it has two versions the overwhelming majority of the jurisdictions follow modified comparative fault, the 50% rule, if you will, and Tennessee does as well. A handful of jurisdictions follow pure comparative fault. First, the modified comparative fault. In modified comparative fault, a trier of fact, usually a judge or a jury, will assess the fault of the defendants and the plaintiff. And as long as the plaintiff is not more than 50% at fault, the plaintiff will recover, but the plaintiff will not recover for his or her share of the fault. So you, you, prorate, you prorate the fault and apply that prorated percentages to the total damage. The plaintiff cannot recover the share of the damages, the total damages that his or her own fault would be. 
right? Now, just jot this down. $100,000 in total damages. The plaintiff is 30% at fault. The defendant is 70% at fault. Under modified comparative fault, the plaintiff is less than 50% at fault. Therefore, the plaintiff can recover. But the plaintiff cannot recover for his share of the fault. So the plaintiff cannot recover 30% of the fault. So the plaintiff can only recover 70% at fault. Okay? That's the modified comparative fault. If the plaintiff is 54% at fault, the plaintiff can't recover anything because his share of the fault is more than 50%. In uh, the minority view, pure comparative fault, it doesn't, if the, if, as long as the plaintiff is not 100% at fault, the plaintiff will recover, can recover something. The plaintiff cannot recover his or her own share of the fault. Um, in my hypothetical, for example, the plaintiff uh, can recover uh, the 70 percent. If you invert it that the plaintiff was 70 percent at fault and the defendant was 30 percent at fault, in a modified comparative fault, the plaintiff loses. In a pure comparative fault, the plaintiff's case is not barred, the plaintiff cannot recover his share of the fault of 70%, but the plaintiff can recover the defendant's share of the fault, which is 30%, or $30,000. California, I think, follows it. Louisiana, maybe Texas. All right, strict liability. Strict liability is the most recent category of tort. In common law, strict liability required the defendant to injure the plaintiff while participating in some ultra-hazardous activity. And in 1960s, I think 1964, in a decision by Justice Chief Justice Trainer of the California Supreme Court, the California Supreme Court expanded to the notion of strict liability to dangerous products. This ends um, the first lecture on torts. The second lecture will resume considering the business torts.